Good evening and welcome. Buonasera e benvenuti. I should just mention that this entire ceremony is being streamed and it's live. And for everyone out there who is watching, welcome to our wonderful gathering here. Um, thank you to Bruno uh, Spinazzola and Basilio and his team for recording this for us. Um, we're gr grateful to you for that. It is an honor and a pleasure to convene this graduation ceremony of our MFA students who are here to celebrate the conclusion of two years of artistic ex exploration and in, in this important milestone in their personal lives and their future careers and aspirations as artists. <laughs> you have been both individually and collectively a wonderful group. I say collectively because you helped each other in ways that strengthened all of you in your work. And I can see that lifelong bonds were formed in your two years here. I've enjoyed getting to know you very, very much. And I um, enjoyed watching you grow and flourish here at Saatchi. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to the families of our graduating students who have come a great distance to be here to share this celebration with us all. I especially would like to recognize our trustees, Stephen Rosefield, our chairman, Liz Cole, Christine Wilding, Sally Smith, and Mary Beckinsale, our former president. I would also like to make special mention of Jules Madoff, the founder of Saatchi in 1973, 75, excuse me, who unfortunately could not join us, but I hope he's watching us today. He sends his good wishes to all of you and wishes you luck in your careers. For all these years, Jules has helped inspire and support thousands, really almost 10, over 10,000 students as artists who, from many nations who've come to Saatchi. As I stand in this room every time, I marvel at this incredible space. And um, for a little bit of background, it was designed by the architect Michelozzo, and it was for Cosimo Medici, for this palace. And um, today, noticing just the strange proportions, this rectangular space, but a very long rectangular space, so I don't think it's the golden triangle. And this beautiful ceiling is named after the artist Luca Giordano, um, who was really the precursor to the Rococo movement. So it's a particularly important work, a fresco, that um, shows a tremendous collaboration, I would say, between architect and fresco painter. Coco, Marga, Ali, Dexter, Victoria, Lindsay, Jane, Maria. I hope each one of you will reflect on these two years of learning, exploration, and creativity and this milestone of your graduation. Apart from the fact that one is inspired just by being in Florence, with exposure to its culture and identity. This has been a period of hard work and dedication, working on your own and collaboratively, as I said. There's something really special about making art in Italy. And I guess many of you have seen the MFA exhibition, um, both at Le Murata for Ali's work and at uh, the Galleria Il Ponte, our MFA studio art and photography show. It's absolutely excellent, and uh, I think you'll all agree with me that we are very proud of the high level of creative skill and energy in one space that we saw. Before I go on, I want to show you a, a short video, I think it's uh, about seven minutes, of our MFA students. We asked them just to answer a few questions. Um, it was filmed by Naima Savioli and was edited by Christina Gnalski, who is our website alumni and media coordinator. She's also an alumna. Okay. I focus on documentary photography but it's been a bit of a long road to get there. I started off doing commercial photography. I've dabbled in street photography. I've always loved portraiture. Um, at the end of the day, I, just, I have an interest in stories. Photography for me 
is the language. It's the language that I use to tell the stories that interest me, that are close to me, or that have to do with things I care about. I'm um, a self-taught artist, and I used to be a full-time artist before I come to the school. But uh, actually, uh, during that time, I was enjoying it a lot. But I feel like uh, I needed some, something more to push me up. So I kind of wanted to know not only the figure as a subject, but also I want to know the personality so I can put into my art with a, some emotion into the painting. So I was trying to find myself uh, into personal emotions from my experience from my past. I came to Saatchi following uh, a long career in international health. And uh, I came here hoping that I would be able to do really one thing, and that was to explore. To explore my own creativity, to try and explore um, my own artistic uh, depth. I wanted to stand back. I wanted to listen to myself. I wanted to try and discover, and I wanted to just um, be there. This body of work, I think, was a way for me to really face a lot of the things that happened over those past eight years that I felt like I kind of slept through and didn't really face at all. I just kind of buried them down and didn't work through them. So in order to really get this built, I had to assign, I had to organize it and assign themes to them because I knew each painting was going to be a very raw reflection of myself. Focusing on these very vague themes that I feel like everybody kind of goes through at one point or another. I didn't want myself to be afraid of them and see them as a weakness. I wanted to highlight that they could be potential strengths. So I work mainly in 2D with acrylic paint and gold on pure linen or paper. And some of the themes I've been focusing on have to do with what I started with the first part of the second year of the MFA, which is my series called The Spaces Between. And this focuses on the transformation that happens between one place and another, or one time and another in a person's life. I'm focusing on the aesthetics of the millennial generation and the parallels it has between um, other similar times of um, just the increase in technology and society and what that means for marketing purposes, um, what that means like moving forward uh, as far as like future trends for um, younger generations and more specifically I explore like what that means for Generation Z in comparison to the millennials. When I thought about how much our generation has changed with technology in this digital world, it didn't make sense to me to experience art on a wall and walk away from it. So I started making installation sensorial art. We have sound, we have scent, we have all of our senses heightened. So I needed to make art that everybody could relate to, not just artists. So that's what I did when I started building my rooms and installations. My approaches to my projects and my mentality about photography as a whole, photography as a medium, um, that is completely and totally different compared to what it was two years ago because I didn't, I didn't have the tools, I didn't have the history, the foundation necessary to um, talk about the things that I wanted to talk about in a way that's um, it's eloquent, really. So being able to see the work that I did two years ago that was touching on these things that maybe wanted to be uh, at the level I am now, and then comparing it to my most recent projects is really nice, because I can see that I, I'm getting closer and closer to being able to produce the kind of work that I've always wanted to. My work now is completely digital. I don't think that's something that I would have expected before. Um, coming from a fine arts background, there's like a part of me that's still attached to like very tangible things, but I mean, these days it just doesn't make sense to do everything so manually, so most of my stuff is digital now. When I first arrived, I mainly worked in installation. I focused on a spiritual aspect of, of the self. Still, it's connected to what I'm doing now. This idea of that, that presence and where you can find peace in that, that place that you are. The changing about uh, my style is not only 
from the material wise, but also technical wise, because if you want to use something new, you also have to alternate your context. It's more about like a renewal. So that first year being here, I think it was taking what I came here with and then also taking from my professors and reconstructing it to form a more cohesive work, in a sense. It was just rebuilding what I thought I knew and relearning things that I thought I knew. I don't know, I think it was just re-falling in love with painting at that point. I was drawn to empty spaces for some reason. I think also the intensity of Florence um, drove me away from the center of town and to some calm. And I found this in abandoned buildings. The whole notion of time and space was coming to the forefront. So that, that became, in fact, something that accompanied me throughout the whole MFA program. Each, each of the textures of our experience can be different, but they can also come together in something we call life. So then I had the idea that I would use the black and white photos from my father and integrate them into the poster photos so that really the idea that the past and the present are very much related to each other. When I was in America, no one looked at me like I was an American. When I came to Italy, the minute I spoke, I had the word visitor written all over my face. So I started really reflecting on identity and why I felt like I couldn't fit into this world. And when I really started diving into culture and identity work, it's when I decided I needed to make my own world. And I could do that within my studio. Making contemporary um, art or design, in my case, um, in the city of the Renaissance has um, actually been more relevant than I had expected. Just because um, in my own work, I've been exploring like um, extreme changes in technology in the past like. 10 years, and I think that's totally relevant to the extreme changes in technology and even art and design in the Renaissance. There's so many parallels in um, just like the way that people have had to adapt to contemporary life. I think it's about how you approach it. The technique also could be the contemporary back then. So that's renewal by their interpretation. I do believe that Florence's reputation uh, looms a bit large for all of us here. <laughs> you can't go to school in the city and pass by the Duomo every day and not be, um, I don't know, a little bit attentive at all times to the fact that this city has so much history and it has so much ris richness. However, um, for me, at least in this point of my work, the things that I find the most interesting about Florence are the stories that maybe aren't so famous and the things that are happening now. For me, that's been a really, really fun part of going to school here is discovering the little, the nooks and crannies of Florence. Some days, I really love it. I can sit on the steps and listen to people walk by and hear 10 different languages in 10 minutes. Other days, I really hate it. But it's really hard trying to fit into a world that was made from the beginning of time. And when you're exposed to that for a two-year program, you learn to really identify who you are and what you stand for. If you've decided to, to contemplate, if you've decided to take a step back to look at what you might be able to express differently or in a, in a creative way, being in a city that has so much to offer in terms of beauty it has been important for, for the work I've done. Being here is a great opportunity, a fabulous experience, and I wouldn't choose anything else, to be honest, because this city glows with, with history, with, with culture. It's beautiful, it's everywhere. You can't not be influenced by it. Being a painter, I'm able to dig way deeper than I could in the States into where it all started. I think it's just a magical process to make work here. inspiring reflections. Before I continue to introduce our faculty and share so that they can share their thoughts, I would like to thank a few people, two very key people,
who have helped organize this one wonderful ceremony down to the tassels that we're wearing here. And they are Lou Lodge, our Interim Dean of, of Students, and Anne Pellegrini, our Interim Dean of Academics. Thank you. I would be remiss if I didn't say something about uh, Luca Carosi, who is our Assistant Facilities Manager. I don't know if he's here. Is Luca here? Oh, he couldn't make it. Shame. He was, un he, it was almost, he could almost make it, but he, hopefully he'll be able to hear, hear what we have to say because I think he has been our go-to person, especially for all of you. And uh, if any of you needed something, whether it's to suspend a sculpture or frame something or do anything that uh, had a, a, any challenges with materials, Luca was there to help and uh, solve the problem without any uh, hesitation. I also want to thank our, our visiting faculty and advisors to all the students who have been so in instrumental in furthering their goals and bringing invaluable perspectives and their experience to our students. And I hope I get everyone, but they are Alessandra Capodacqua, Molly Di Grazie, Francesca Lauretta, Pietro Manzo, Lucia Mun Minun Minuno, I knew I wouldn't get that right. I hope Lucia is here too, uh, <laughs> to hear me not get the name correct. Um, Margarita Abozzo, and um, also our instructors, Dejan Atakanovic, uh, Dario Arachimoni, John Taylor, Tino Fellani, Pietro Galliano. I'm sure I'm forgetting some, but they are all firmly in our minds and memories for this, the incredible support they gave to the students. Each one of our students was shaped and enhanced by their teachers. For Saatchi to maintain its standards as an exemplary institution, it must foster the, and provide the best educators, artists, and practitioners we can find. I'm proud to recognize and thank our core group of MFA instructors, including our director of the MFA program, Felipe Rocha de, Roja de Silva, Daria, Fila, Daria Filardo, Romeo Di Loreto, Jacopo Santini, and the director of uh, communication design, Camila Torna. Um, I, th I would like to invite Felipe to come up and say a few words. As a director of stu the Studio Art Program, I often, as you imagine, I often ask myself, what does this mean? It is very much, um, the meaning is very much based on practice. All studio artists that I know and my own studio experience, this is how I, I try to understand what uh, studio art means. The group of studio artists who today are having their graduation ceremony arrived at Saatchi the same day I took office as director of the MFA. We made a parallel path during these almost two years, and consequently, I must be forgiven for feeling even closer to this group. We were all together most of the time in the studio during the whole of our first uh, year. I had to listen to their conversations, sometimes, sometimes trivial or even nonsense, and they were listening to mine. At the studio, and this is the first truth about the studio life, at the studio it is very difficult to keep secrets. A studio philosophy is something that we want to transmit in this program, now seriously. What is an artist's studio? What rules should we apply in our studio? The ethics should be the same that we use outside. Our social politics, as applied to the city, the polis, also useful inside the studio? What is the role of the artist in the studio? In our studio, are we eventually the next after God, like the captain in his ship? 
Do we work for ourselves or for the others? What if we got bored during lonely studio work? Or if we get bored during lonely studio work? Should we seek immediate pleasure? Should the potential public have a word to say in what we do? What about the curators, the art galleries, and other partners? Art speak, is it important? How to handle immediate success or uh, temporary failure? We are kept asking these and other questions, and the answer keep changing. The answers keep changing. I have been a studio artist for more than 40 years now, and my answers are still tentative. But the fact that we are in the studio and our mind is awake creates the standard of professional consistency that we could all witness at the MFA exhibition at Galleria Il Ponte, one of the historical and most professional contemporary galleries in, in Florence. So this means that we are the, not the only ones who, who believe in this uh, consistency. One thing that I'm happy to say about all five graduating studio art students is that in their own totally different way, they are highly trained professional artists. More than try some kind of psychological descriptive praise for which I'm not totally equipped, I am more than happy to assure above reasonable doubt that they received a strong studio art education. Uh, I will first mention Jane Mason, uh, Lindsay Johnson and Maria Nissen. My dear colleague Daria Filardo will then refer to Dexter and Victoria Hodge. Jane, Ma Jane Mason would certainly win the first prize for regular work effort. If such prize did exist, we might create one next year. Jane painted every single day from nine, sometimes to light, evening. She has already largely made up for the years when her life was outside the studio. Our typical dialogues will, would be, Jane, look at the East for inspiration. Invariable, the answer would be, my painting is still not finished, or else, Jane, the head is too big. Yes, yes, it is still not finished. <laughs> but even when we thought she was not listening and was just being polite, as she always is, she was attentive, and her work now shows much more power and spontaneity than in the beginning of the program. And her Eastern roots have found her way back into her work. Uh, Self-representation has replaced a more voyeuristic and superficial themes. Jane's work has improved immensely, uh, showing that uh, in studio art, effort has its own uh, rewards. It's a, it's a happy, it's a story with a happy ending. Lindsay Johnson, was the best companion in the studio during the first year. She would constantly paint. In the first year, her studio was one of the most dangerous ones <laughs> regarding painting contamination. It was impossible to enter without getting paint stains on our clothes. She was constantly building and destroying huge paintings depicting human figures overpainting or ripping them apart into pieces according to her mood. This year, she built a whole new systematic approach based on autobiographical narrative, full of gender sensitivity, profound human and personal drama. Being an extremely uh, courageous and brave woman, following other social movements that did something similar, she faced and, uh, and through painting exposed publicly some of the main questions that had haunted her youth. Studio art thus become a healing ritual 
exercising the evil that affected her growth by making it blatant. It also became a social ritual by acting on other human beings who identify with the same issues. It worked. With the help of wonderful advisors like Molly Di Grazia and Margarita Abozzo, who are actually here, her paintings and other contents, her writing as well, are vibrant manifestos expressing freedom from trauma. And she did all this while painting like an angel, quoting Margarita, who is uh, also here. Instead, all my interactions with Maria Nissen would rather start as follows. Felipe, where are my 13 lights? Felipe, I need 16 pieces of wood forming corners of 90 degrees. Felipe, where can I buy Arabic coffee? Felipe, where is Luca? <laughs> <laughs> All these very precise and urgent needs relating to logistics show us someone who from the beginning at Sachi knew she could not afford to lose five minutes since she, had, she, since she had gigantic tasks ahead of her and the whole world waiting for her work. Her certainties and self-assurance were such that the only thing she asked, or rather demanded, were the conditions to build all her space-challenging projects. For her, Sachi was at the same time a school, a studio, and the center of contemporary art where she could share her work while still waiting for larger challenges. Her resolute activity put pressure on Satsi's structure based on decades of short study abroad programs. Satsi was forced to improve and raise to new levels of graduate activity. During these years, her eyes scanned everything that was or looked contemporary in Florence and the rest of Europe. Even if she speaks limited Italian, she seems to know everyone and lots of people know her. One of her most trusted advisors, Pietro Galliano, said during the graduate review board that she was the first MFA such as studio art student who really connected uh, the program to the outside world in Florence. Her remarkable record during the Sachi, during the MFA years, is to be continued by a joint exhibition with Victoria de Blasi on the next May 3rd in Le Murate in Florence. The first of a series of exhibitions and, and, and other works that I, even without having coffee future reading skills, predict will never end. Thank you. Okay, I always get this wrong because I never write speeches and I uh, have to know that this audience always does, but I, you will forgive me because I am Italian and so I, I, I really, I can't do this, but I have some notes. I want to thank the school. I want to thank Sachi, as always in these graduations, every time that I'm here, and I'm here from the first one, I do because it's always a challenge for me and it's always something that I am grateful huh? To, to do, because every two years I learn something new, and every two years, as I'm not an artist, but I'm a curator, I learn how to deal with artists and different processes in, in a better way. Um, this two-year program is intense. It's intense in experience, it's intense in uh, uh, cultural gap that the students have, whatever part of the world, uh, not just aside from Italy, they come from, because they really experience this, and they experience a, a, a richness, and um, they experience Europe at large. We bring them around, 
we uh, go to art fairs, we go to exhibitions, we go to churches and museums, and all this is something that it's hard to um, digest, and so these two years are full, no? They come and they have a first year of like an amazing, you know, difficulty and experimentation and then a second year in which they try to find their own voice and usually this magic at the end always happens. This year we discussed with Felipe um, extensively by having, um, before the final show, by having uh, another part of the course which we discuss also with Pietro which is my colleague in the second year course which was meant to train them no, to be artists even, even more no, by doing a solo exhibition, by you know, confronting, getting out of the studio, confronting with the space and with all the challenges that an artist's life needs. Each one of them did and did a, a very good job and each one of them was much more ready to you know, get to the final show which was a success as you all commented. So I, I do teach in both years, so I, I stay with them like the whole time. Huh? And um, yes, I could cry too. <laughs> and, um, but I have to speak about Victoria and about Dexter. And what I have to say is that um, Victoria has been a very um, optimist and intelligent presence hmm? all throughout the two years, very, um, pushing to, the, to have the better experience, no? to look for the good side. And what I think she did is to really make these two years worth it. You know, being in Italy for her meant to dive into the, the language, the culture, the artistry, the um, learning Italian, no? and being able to work and listen closely to her professor and to the artist that she need and she chose to work with. So she made this experience uh, something that will never leave her. No? So her sense of line, of preciousness, of clear, of space, of, of building a space with a precious and religious sense has grown since the first time, since the beginning that she has come. Um, again, because of this, we're surrounded by gold, and, um, and because of the precise no, um, attention to the detail that Victoria has. So I'm sure that she will continue, no? that she will continue to learn, to listen, and to be able to um, take what it's given as a gift to her and make it, you know, worth it into a very particular and singular and important experience. So I am sure that you will be, you know, growing even more in your future life. And about Dexter, what can I say? She's a very gentle and very precious human being. And we have we have worked together since the first year, and I have learned um, to met, to meet, excuse me, um, her world, her imagination, her um, her characters who are populating her art. So much inspired by artistry, uh, so much inspired by comics, so much inspired by, by several uh, and very different origins and yet so um, intensively um, with the need, with the urgence of coming out and find a new um, generative world to create a new world, a new universe. And you did create a new universe. We all, all have seen uh, also a globe no? in her uh, final show or a cloud that we were immersed in in, in the solo show. I think that Dexter came back to Europe where she belongs. I think you totally belong here for the history, for all the literary reference that you, uh, that you know, for the books that she, um, 
that she bought, you know, with being around and entering a studio was like a wonderful and magical place where you could find, you know, fairy tales from the 1800 bought in England or, you know, a, a comic uh, book from Japan or, I mean, it was always amazing and for me, who I don't have this, you know, generative imagination, it was always a marvel, no? to listen to her story and to see those characters coming out, you know, in the canvases or in the drawings or in the preciousness of, you know, using the watercolor, you know, and thinking of the old Japanese ways of, you know, underlying just the line, no, in, in the paper. Um, I know you're an artist, you've always been since you came here, and I am sure that um, you will continue and you will build new worlds that people will, you know, learn to know. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, first, I'm going to say um, a couple things. Uh, Dadia said that the Italians don't like to write things, and they go up and they speak. Uh, I write things, uh, but I still get it wrong, uh, constantly get it wrong. Uh, one thing that's off my program, but I don't know why it never dawned on me until 10 minutes ago, uh, and it explains a lot about um, extremely, in my opinion, strong group. They're all females. And I don't know if that's correct to say, but I needed to say this because you guys have a drive. Again, I'm also talking now off program to the studio arts. A drive that I've not seen in a long, long time. If you guys don't have this drive after today, I don't know what I'm going to say. I can't say I'll kill you because that's politically incorrect, but I'll be really, really sad. <laughs> now I'll go on to my program. I mean, because you're strong, strong characters. I want to talk, talk first about Coco, then I'm going to talk about Maga, and then I have to talk about them together. And then I think Jacob may say similar things, but I need to talk about both as well because I think it's fundamental. Today's an extremely emotionally charged day for me, not only because it's commencement. I have in front of me the first person I met when I came to Florence. I came to work with this man, George Teich, which is emotionally really, really touching for me. Um, so if I, um, I'm not um, calm, uh, just bear with me. I'll start with my traditional methods of doing things, which is basically keynotes, or I would say key words to my students. My dearest Coco, I promise that I will not look at you too much, because then it's the end. <laughs> now my keynotes, or my key words. Strong, fearless, convinced, Scared, endless, endlessly brave, Italian, Prosecco, Taralini, <laughs> humble, open-minded, an activist. You'll all be included, but you'll never be excluded. Equality, involvement, beauty, change, results, result, 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 passion. And now is a sentence. A modern, convinced, civil activist, scared and endlessly brave and humble, a photographer with passion, a passion to live and to make others live equally. Now I talk about Margarita, or Maga, because we know her as Maga. My dearest Maga, again, I promise I will, I'll look at you sometimes, because her and I have this kind of in common joke. The key words. Strong, weak, no, strong, with four explanation marks. Magical, like the hat that comes out of the rabbit, not the rabbit that comes out of the hat. Enchanting, curious, you. Over 90 yous, like 90 plus countries you visited. Human, a believer, a dreamer. A protector, fearless, extra strong. A thinker, Prosecco Taralini. <laughs> you admire, you're listened to, you're adventurous, flexible, an explorer of self. 
You are gathering your hundreds and thousands of fragments that make you. An, intent, an enchanting, magical rabbit which comes out of a hat, fearless and strong, an adventurous explorer who is admired and listened to by all. A photographer that makes, and this I'm taking from our review, the invisible understandable. And now I have to talk about them both because it's, I cannot do this. Coco Maga, Maga Coco. It's like who comes first, the egg or the chicken? Is it a glass which is half full or half empty? In this case, there are two halves that make a full. It is rather difficult to imagine one without the other at this point. Two extraordinary human beings, two extraordinary MFA candidates, two extraordinary image makers. Like a glass, half full, half empty, there are two halves. And this glass, which contains them, it unites them, meshes them, strengthens them. What is this glass? Photography, creation, thinking, feeling, hearing, believing, doubting, laughing, life. They live and they love to live and they make others live along with them. Thank you. Grazie. Well, um, I will start with Coco. And uh, I, I share completely what Romeo said about their combination, which has been unpredictable and, and so pleasant to have uh, between you. I think it has been a, a way to reinforce each other and a way to facilitate our job. Believe me, it's, uh, it has been a pleasure and an honor to work with you. Said that, um, I have two key words, but one for Coco, one for Maga. The one for Coco is otherness. And I think that she has dealt with otherness constantly she, since the first day. What I realized is that uh, 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 the first impression I had of you is that you uh, perceived your own otherness uh, instead of uh, the otherness of Italy when you, come, when you came here. It's quite, it's quite interesting, this kind of process, because generally when someone comes from abroad in an American institution as a, such is, perceives this Italy as, a, as something that we, has, we have to deal with, and by you perceived your own uh, difference and separation from the country. And all of your work has been an attempt, very successful indeed, to uh, fill the gap. That's what I think. Um, the first step has been the language. And I think that learning Italian has been a, a fundamental step for you. Uh, believe me, Coco speaks uh, an excellent Italian. And I hope she won't forget it. And I hope you will keep staying here because, you know, practice makes the success of the knowledge of a language. Uh, she has learned Italian, and all her work has, has been about uh, uh, building bridges between her and the comprehension of a country, the comprehension of the other. And uh, that's what she's done with uh, all of her projects. Um, she, someone said, and I agree completely with that, that she's been a, an activist photographer. What does it mean? Uh, you can photograph in many ways. Eduardo Galeano, and this is my gift for you, said it in a beautiful way. Uh, he said that charity is vertical and it uh, humiliates. Solidarity is a horizontal and it helps. And that's what I've tried to do, I guess. And that's what you have succeeded in doing, I'm sure of. Um, what does it mean that in all the projects you've done, and I'm not talking about the, the first year, but I'm talking about the second year project, you stayed in between, you shared a space, and you try to be horizontal, to look at people straight in the eye. I don't know how many of you have had the luck to go to the exhibition that takes place, that has been organized at Il Ponte Gallery, but the, the meaning of those large portraits lay in this desire by Coco to make those faces and those identities unavoidable. And I think she succeeded fully in doing this. And I think it's the best praise I can make of you. You made those identities, those stories, unavoidable and necessary. Mm, uh, the last thing I can, I, can, I, can, I can tell you is about something that I completely believe. The base of aesthetic is ethic. And uh, you do things when they are needed. You do things because you think they're necessary. Um, it is the only way to survive a world uh, where the dissemination of images has become chronicle and insane. 
Um, the only reason why someone should continue to photograph is because uh, he or she wants to create something which corresponds to her private, deep necessities. And I think you've done it. And it's the best thing I can tell of you. I have a wish for you. Uh, I wish you to keep this consciousness and to look restlessly and without ever being discouraged uh, uh, for the fleeting, fragile balance of whoever makes the choice like you. Being a witness and being an activist. Being in front and being inside. Uh, because don't forget this. Photographing as well as living is not just having a point of view, it's being a point of view. Thank you. And, um, and uh, this is for you, Maga. Uh, well, the best comment about Maga was made by Anne, who is here, I guess. Uh, during the review, she said that uh, Maga Margarita does justice to her name. And I believe so. Uh, Maga has a, is a problem-solving woman, is a patient, wise, curious, and uh, interested and involved. And the last adjective is the, one of the most important, I think. Um, there is a, a question that, that came out during the review, and it, it was a simple one. She had alluded to uh, the fact that the photography uh, uh, experimented uh, during the two-year program as such, it had opened many doors. And I made a question, uh, how, w w which doors exactly? And she said a very simple thing that could be the, the last and final comment about Maga's work. Uh, I spent a lifetime uh, representing the others and uh, sometimes without being fully convinced about certain politics, but because I felt the necessity of doing it. And um, for the very first time, I had a chance to represent myself somehow and to look in depth inside myself and to respond to the questions that I have for myself and to give an answer when possible and in the best way I know. And I think you've done. Which questions are magas? Well, the key word is time is a double word. It's time and memory. Um, all the work is about that. Uh, uh, whoever saw the prints that she hang in the Ponte Gallery uh, could, be, could agree with me about the fact that uh, you have the impression of uh, looking at the, the past that's it, that, that is asking to, to whisper to the present. That combination of posters that correspond to the present and images for, from, from Maga's past uh, are the attempt of uh, responding to a dilemma. What is the time? What is the time about? Maga's work made me think about St. Augustine that said once, I know what is the time, but when people ask me what it is, I don't know what to say. And uh, maybe it could be the combination of past, present, and future. But past uh, doesn't exist any longer. Future doesn't exist yet. So maybe the time is the present of the past, the present, and the present of the future. The memory, concludes St. Augustine, is the present of the past. And that's what you have done, in my opinion. Um, I have a, a gift for you, too, which is a poem by a great woman, Wisla Vashimborska and uh, which is titled uh, The Three Oddest Words. I hope my pronunciation is understandable because the quality of Szymborska's poem uh, deserves a very good English, and I'm not, sure, I'm not sure mine is. When I pronounce the word future, the first syllable already belongs to the past. When I pronounce the word silence, I destroy it. When I pronounce the word nothing, I make something no known being can hold. Thank you. Hello, good evening. This is my first time here. So I would like to thank the whole school. I would especially like to thank the colleagues that work in the design area, Elena Lombardi, Dusko Stojanovic, uh, Michael, Michael Laws, uh, Matteo Berton, and many others that have supported us in this process. Alexandra Wong, Ali, is the first graduate of the Saatchi program in communication design. And I would like to describe her and her work with three words. The first word is planner. It's not very funny but it actually, it's a very important word. 
According to the Italian designer Bruno Munari, a designer is a planner with an aesthetic sense. The newborn program aims at coaching a confident branding designer or maybe an illustrator or a creative coder, but mostly a new kind of professional that is successful in planning. So Ellie is a born planner. From the very start of the, pro the program, she has challenged my vision of teaching as uh, myeutics. Myeutics is the Greek word for midwifery. And in this case, it meant that teachers had to help a designer be born from a person with a background in studio arts. In Ellie's case, the baby was born very quickly. <laughs> the second word is intelligent. Looking at the body of Ellie's work, um, intelligence in the original sense of looking deep into things and being able to choose. Intelligence that in the field of design leads directly to creativity, because quoting Bruno Munari again, sorry, to complicate is simple, but to simplify is very complicated. And progress means simplifying and not complicating. So Ellie's capacity to create meaningful visuals is the product of a mature designer's intelligence that can distill what is worth showing and what is not. Last but not least is the word passionate, if not maybe political. Um, throughout the program, Ali has shown moral integrity and a passion for social issues. And no wonder that both converged into her final project. In this very, very original research, she has <clears throat> Excuse me. She has acted as the author, the illustrator, and the designer packaging all this uh, uh, amount of information together. Not to mention that she personally represents the demographics of millennials that the paper deals with. And in the end, she has provided us with a new perspective on the contemporary design and branding world and reaching our vision in a way that nobody our age could do. I have learned to detect meaning through visual signs in the environment that were invisible to me before. This is a higher role, I think, of a communication designer, to make the world a better place by educating people to read visual languages and therefore by empowering them to choose throughout understanding. So I would finally like to praise Alexandra for setting such a high standard for the program and give her credit for her intelligent and passionate planning. We could not imagine a better candidate for our first graduate and I wish her all the professional satisfaction that she deserves. I think you've all heard how incredibly passionate our teachers are. And if I can borrow what Daria said, um, you've helped to meet their imagination in really creative and wonderful ways. And I personally thank you all for what you've done for our students. Let's give it up for the teachers. OK. The moment we've been waiting for here to introduce our keynote speaker, George Teje. Um, before I invite him up, I would like to say a few words about him. I think it's important that we, for those of you who don't already know who he is, uh, that I share his extraordinary career. Um, George lived in Europe and in the Middle East most of his youth and studied English literature at Belois College in Wisconsin, where he also began photography under the guidance of the Hungarian photographer Michael Simon. In 1973, he moved to Italy, where he worked in Rome as a journalist and then in Todi Umbria, where he lived for 12 years working as a freelance photographer and writer with reviews for Art Forum. 
His first exhibition in Italy was in 1973, two years before Saatchi started, at the Diaframma Gallery in Milan. His first book, um, excuse me, uh, his first book, Perugia Terra Vecchia Terra Nuova, came out in 1984. From 1986 to 2003, he was director of photography at the Alinari Archives in Florence, producing photographs in every region in Italy, publishing in many, uh, in many of their volumes. He has held workshops and exhibitions throughout the world, and his photographs can be found in major museum collections in the US and in Europe, such as the Metropolitan Museum collections in, uh, uh, of New York, excuse me, the George Eastman House in Rochester, the Houston Museum of Fine Arts, or I should say Houston, some, some Americans say Houston, Houston Street in New York, uh, and Centre Canadien, the architecture in Montreal, the Helmut Gernsheim collection in Mannheim, and the Maison Europeenne de la Photographie in Paris. His work has been exhibit, exhibited at the American Academy in Rome, as a solo exhibition in 1981, at the MASP in Sao Paulo, Brazil in 1988, also solo, at the Venice Biennale in 1995, at the Peggy Guggenheim Museum in Venice in 2005, at the Rice, uh, Rice Engelhorn Museum in Mannheim in 2003, at the GEH in Rochester in 2004, and at Rome's Maxi in 2007. His solo exhibition presents his Italian landscapes opened at the Villa Bardini in Florence in 2008 and has since been then traveled to the CAMEC of La Spezia, the museum in Trastevere in Rome, Palazzo Gob Gobcevic in Trieste, and opened in Perugia at the Rocca Paolina in September 2010. In 2010, he was awarded the Fruili Ven Venezia Giulia Prize for photography. We thank you, George, for being here and sharing your thoughts with us. Please come. Thank you. I have a rather embarrassing admission to make. This is the first time I've ever worn a cap and gown I'm simply not a ceremonial type, and when I graduated in 1972, it was June and hot, and it meant waiting around for 10 more days. A classmate, my best friend and now the great American poet Brooks Haxton, invited me to go fishing with him at his home in Natchez, Mississippi, so that's what we did. Still, I want to emphasize now how honored I am to have been invited to speak today, 45 years later, in a cap and gown that's been custom fit for me. <laughs> I was a little frantic as soon as I had been asked to do this, so I googled commencement speech, and this is what turned up. A commencement speech is an opportunity to share your experience, values, and advice. The precise form is up to you. This affords the speaker a platform to say unlimited things. Well, as there are no limitations to what I can talk about, I thought I'd share with you what I learned from a 400-page book I translated last year, Photographic Lenses in 19th Century Germany and Austria. <clears throat> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I did translate the book, but I'm not going to talk about it or about photography at all and even very little regarding sculpture and painting, so the photographers won't be the only ones feeling left out. <laughs> I want to talk about art as a whole, and specifically about literature as well. My greatest love in life is literature, which is what I studied at school. I think I need first, however, to give you an idea of where these ideas are coming from. I was born to an Italian mother and an American father. Art was what they cared about most, and my sisters and I were fortunate to have lived in many places and to have been dragged to museums and concerts everywhere. Gigliola taught art history, and my dad adored music, especially Bach and opera. It was my mother who gave me her too complicated camera at age 14. 
As I am addressing primarily the students here who are about to embark on a new chapter in their lives, my intention today is to celebrate them and also their instructors by celebrating the realm of human activity which they have so bravely chosen to contribute to, that is, the realm of creativity. The renowned biologist and naturalist E. O. Wilson won the Pulitzer Prize in 2011 for a book he wrote entitled Origins of Creativity. This is what he wrote. What then is creativity? It is the innate quest for originality, the driving force in humanity's instinctive love of novelty, the discovery of new entities and processes, the solving of old challenges and the disclosure of new ones, the aesthetic surprise of unanticipated facts and theories, the pleasure of new faces, the thrill of new worlds. We judge creativity by the magnitude of the emotional response it evokes. We follow it inward toward the greatest depths of our minds and outward to imagine reality across the universe. As I said earlier, it is the world of literature that I would like to focus my attention on. Over several decades of reading, I have toyed with the idea of compiling a list of passages in novels that illustrate the transformative power of art. Art that has the ability to illuminate and even affect the course of one's life. I will mention just a few of these today. The first is Miguel Cervantes' classic, Don Quixote. The great critic, Harold Bloom, has said repeatedly that there has been nothing in the history of literature to equal Cervantes and Shakespeare, not Joyce, Tolstoy, Dickens, or James. Cervantes takes us on a journey that lasts over a thousand pages, events that are both exhilarating and devastating. The two protagonists, Don Quixote and his squire, Sancho Panza, delight us with their insane humor, their witty exchanges and their loyalty and devotion to defending the weak and the oppressed. The entire novel revolves around the imaginary, sometimes hallucinatory tendencies of our famous knight. Over time, the adjective quixotic was coined to mean extravagant or visionary. For me, the most powerful moment, the climax of this novel, comes only a few pages from the end when the two adventurers have finally returned home and Quixote suddenly takes ill. We see the desperation of his best friends when they hear him renounce the fantastical world of chivalry and courtly love that he had been consumed by his entire life. They beg him to reconsider. The friends' realization that this unique man is dying and that soon they will no longer be able to enjoy his inventive mind suddenly becomes unbearable. Cervantes writes, when his three friends heard him talk thus, they concluded that he was stricken with some new madness. Sanson then said to him, what does all this mean, Don Quixote? Now that we are just about to become shepherds and spend our days singing and living like princes, you talk about turning yourself into a hermit. No more foolish tales, I beg you, come back to your senses. Woe is me, cried Sancho in all tears. Don't die on me. Take my advice and live on for many a year. The maddest trick a man can play in life is to yield up the ghost without more ado. Shame on you, master. The power of Don Quixote's imagination had become an integral part of their lives too. A nourishment, a balm for the emptiness, the adversities, the pains of life, and they are horrified at the idea of its loss. Imagination is our propellant, our haven, our lifeline. Another work I would like to mention is The Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann, which won him the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1929. I imagine that for many of the younger generation, this name doesn't mean much, certainly less than Don Quixote. A little background then. Mann was German, born in 1875, and wrote The Magic Mountain at about age 50 after the disastrous First World War and the eve of Hitler's rise to power. I thought it would be pertinent to talk about this book as it is a novel about initiation 
a commencement, if you will. A young man, Hans Kastorp, about to start a career in engineering, discovers while visiting a cousin at a sanitarium that he too has a mild case of tuberculosis. His condition does not get better, and the three weeks he had expected to remain there turn into seven years. Castorp lives in an unreal atmosphere, not unlike the ivory towers of academia, secluded in the mountains among many very interesting personalities, some of them patients there and others visitors. It is in this place that he undergoes a heightening process that makes him capable of experiences in sensual, moral, and intellectual spheres that he would never have dreamed of in the flatlands. One particular experience that struck me, and the reason I have included this novel in my talk, is his discovery of the potency of music. The director of the sanitarium is concerned about the morale of his patients and is constantly proposing activities. One day, he provokes an explosion of joy in the guests when he has a new invention delivered, a gramophone, the best on the market. Castorp takes charge and becomes the custodian of this delicate machine and the large record collection made up of operas and symphonies. To read man's description and the effect this object has on the patients, and in particular on Castor, on Castorp, is one of the most moving definitions of art and its revelatory power. Mann writes, while the director was introducing his new toy to the guests, the young man had remained in the background, not laughing or applauding as they, but following the performance with tense interest. Several times he restlessly shifted his position, then he took up his stand close to the director with his hands behind his back and an enigmatic expression on his face, fixing the casket with his eye. But within him something was saying, hold on, this is an epic. This thing was sent to me. He was filled with the surest foreknowledge of a new passion, a new enchantment, a new burden of love. The youth in the flatland, who at first sight of a maiden marvels to find himself pierced to the heart with love's barbed arrow, feels not greatly different. This chapter, Fullness of Harmony, continues with extraordinary descriptions of his appreciation of various Italian and French operas and ends finally with a song by Franz Schubert, The Linden Tree, a piece known and beloved by all German people. Mann's writing skips from philosophical inquiries to impassioned exchanges, and it is hard to reveal in just a few quotes. Please note how many times he uses the word love. May we take it that our simple hero, after so many years of hermetic pedagogic discipline, of ascent from one stage of being to another, has now reached a point where he is conscious of the meaningfulness of his love and the object of it? We assert, we record, that he has. To him, the song meant a whole world, a world which he must have loved, else he could not have so desperately loved that, that which it represented and symbolized to him. And finally, a book that may not have changed my life, but certainly one that has taught me how to better deal with problems. Robert Persig's Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It came out in 1974, after 25 publishers rejected it, and it has become a classic cult book translated into many languages. It's about a motorcycle trip a father takes with his 11-year-old son across the US. The father is trying desperately to reconnect with his son after having spent a year in an insane asylum. While teaching at a university, he had lost his mind in an obsessive attempt to define the concept of quality. This book is subtitled, An Inquiry into Values. The father is retracing his steps to try to understand his past schizophrenia and therefore attempt to reunite, reunite his two identities. And again, a young person, his son, 
an adolescent concerned about his future and his own identity. Persig proposes, and this is what struck me most profoundly, that we must abandon the dichotomy of romanticism versus classicism or the fear of technology in favor of nature. As the title suggests, he posits that with the right attitude, an open Zen mind, one can accept and appreciate technology and in the end, better one's life. He writes, the ugliness that some people flee is not inherent in technology. It only seems that way to them because it's so hard to isolate what it is within technology that's so ugly. But technology is simply the making of things. And the making of things can't by its own nature be ugly, or there would be no possibility for beauty in the arts, which also include the making of things. Actually, the root word technology is the Greek techne, which originally meant art. The ancient Greeks never separated art from manufacture in their minds, and so they never developed separate words for them. So this brings me to the group of graduate students we are honoring today. In visiting with them, viewing their work, and questioning them, I found that what unites their art is precisely the inquiry into identity, and in many cases, that of coping with new technologies. Victoria Hodge and Alexandra Wong are both concerned with this fascinating transitional moment between analog and digital techniques. Victoria in a very intimate and spiritual way, and Alexandra with the use of symbolic, even iconic subjects. I sensed very complex identities in the work of Jane Mason with her Korean Atlanta, Georgia past and her heroic struggle to adapt to structure after her self-taught origins. In Lindsay Johnson with her Catholic heritage and her fight to take feminism to a higher poetic level. In Jay Dexter, and the multiple identities mirrored in the Tiepolo-like panoplies, inspired perhaps by her early love of the flight of birds. And Maria Nissan, there she is, who through her work has so beautifully bridged her complex Iraqi American past with the identities of all those who have in some way communed together in the coffee shops across her hometown. Coco Laney, our deep South Alabamian photographer, more than on her own question of personal identity, has focused her lens in a lyrical, journalistic mood, delicately scrutinizing the identities past and future of those African immigrants fortunate enough to have made it alive across the Mediterranean. And finally, Maga, who probably has the most complex self of all, based in Geneva, but born and raised in Zimbabwe of Swedish parents and working 16 years for the World Health Organization in Indonesia, Jamaica, and other countries. It was especially exciting for me to see how she has found the perfect balance of technology and aesthetics to create her striking images. I was happily surprised by how you are all women a sign of the times that are finally changing in a very positive way. I believe we should have put women in positions of political power long before now. Women are more circumspect, more patient, and more loving. As the German poet Rilke writes, women in whom life lingers and dwells more immediately, more fruitfully, and more confidently must surely have fundamentally, have become fundamentally riper people, more human people than easygoing man who is not pulled down below the surface of life by the weight of any fruit of his body. I know from my own career and from watching those of my two children, <sighs> William, pianist, composer in Brooklyn, and Alice, a dancer, performance artist in London. How difficult a decision it is to devote one's life to art 
It is often a life of solitude, of sacrifice, and of paucity. That's an elegant way of saying you could be penniless. But I can think of nothing nobler to gift, to gift the world like Cervantes with your imagination, like Mann with your passion, and like Persig with your devotion to truth and to value is the highest form of altruism and generosity. I do sincerely believe that art can save the world. Art brings people closer to one another by its need to share. Being an artist is to belong to a family. It is an act of love. Seeing the work of the artist choreographer Tino Segal last year at the Palais de Tokyo in Paris overwhelmed me with this message. There was nothing on the walls of this vast exhibition space. Only his performers and dancers moving, running, and accosting visitors to relate in brief but intense anecdotes some of their most intimate secrets. I left the museum totally uplifted and filled with a sense of a transcendent universal love that I have never felt before. One of my favorite more recent writers, John Berger, talks about how other people's stories can enter into our bloodstream and become a part of our collective being. As everything I have said today, the same could apply to a painting, a photograph, a dance, or a song. It is with this last passage that I will end my talk today honoring our eight graduate students. This is from one of the last works Berger wrote called Bento's Sketchbook. When we are impressed and moved by a story, it engenders something that becomes or may become an essential part of us. And this part, whether small or extensive, is the story's descendant or offspring. What I'm trying to define is more idiosyncratic and personal than a mere cultural inheritance. It is as if the bloodstream of the red story joins the bloodstream of one's life story. It contributes to our becoming what we become and will continue to become. Without any of the complications and conflicts of family ties, these stories that shape us are our coincidental as distinct from our biological ancestors. Somebody in this Paris suburb, perhaps sitting tonight in a chair and reading the brothers Karamazov, may already, in this sense, be a distant, distant cousin. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. And now to the moment we've all been waiting for, the conferring of the degrees. I would like to invite Liz Cole, one of our trustees, to come up uh, to and um, also um, Camila Torna, who's going to assist us with the placement of the hoods. And I will announce your name. First, we're going to start with MFA in photography, and I'd like to invite Coco Laney to come, come up. <laughs> I'm going to say your name in full, Margarita Schold.
And I'd like to ask Alexandra Wong from MFA in Communication and Design to come up. Now we move to the MFA in Studio Art, and I'd like to invite Jay Dexter to come up. <laughs> and next, Victoria Jane Elizabeth Hodge. Lindsay, we wait for the silence. Sorry. Lindsay K. Johnson. Jane Mason. <laughs> and last but not least, Maria Khalid Nissan. I, I was going to add a few wise words, but George had was his words of advice were so poignant and beautiful that I'm going to not say anything more, except for one thing that I feel is important to share. And um, today is Earth Day, and I just want to emphasize the role of artists in the time of political turmoil and recognizing that this is a milestone, but you have so much more to give. And as human rights are being eroded and the sustainability of our planet is in question, and the ethical role of, and the importance of artists and designers just becomes ever more important. And you artists play such an important role for all of us. And I just want to say your voice must be heard and our art is essential that it is heard. Okay, now that you are part of the Saatchi alumni family, <laughs> I want to just say that we will be following you closely with all your success. We wish you a continued success and we would like to also have you follow us and make sure that you keep us uh, in touch, keep in touch with us and, and let us know what uh, you're doing. And I'd like to invite all of us to a room just next door, next door here to have a celebratory drink, something to eat. Let's move next door, pop the champagne corks, and drink to the success of our students. <laughs> <laughs>